tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. These intricate formations are known as crop circles. They often pop up overnight in the middle of nowhere. Many are attributed to clever pranksters. Others have no rational explanation at all. Are they the work of some strange force on Earth or something not of this world? Still lonely and heartbroken from the sudden death of his beloved wife, Charles Barker was happy when a new woman entered his life. However, his happiness was to be as short-lived as the relationship. Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis, same age, same height, same features, danced teammates and neighbors until they were snatched off the street near this Oregon City apartment complex. Unspeakable crimes that have left a small town gripped with fear and authorities hunting for the worst kind of predator. A violent gang member reportedly wreaks havoc on the quiet streets of Milwaukee, leaving three innocent people dead. Police are asking for your help in apprehending the suspect before more lives are lost. One final piece of information may be all that's needed to solve a mystery. Perhaps someone watching can help. Perhaps it's you. Edmonton, Alberta, on the western edge of the Canadian prairie. Rusty Manuel and Thelly Whitman had been driving home from the city when they were flagged down by one of their farmhands. Hey. Hey. You all done? Yep. Yeah. He said, you have a circle in your field. And I said, yes, I know the darn animals. They're always lying down and, and flattening the grain. And he said, oh, no, it had to be an awfully big animal to make this circle. What Rusty and Thelly discovered were seven crop circles pressed into thistle and barley, comprising a formation about 190 feet long. It was just amazing. What made this? How could it be made? You know, what, what's going on here? The grain was all flattened down, and it almost looked like a pattern, like petals, the way the grain came out, and then the heads turned back in towards the center again. I got a hold of the city police. The city police did come out. Uh, he was totally amazed. Soon after the startling discovery was made, the Canadian Crop Circle Research Network was contacted. CCCRN is a group of volunteers dedicated to gathering information about the mystery of crop circles. Judy Arndt is a field researcher with the organization. It looked like a place had been electrocuted. The plants were so badly frazzled. It was just amazing. Uh, looked like there had been a huge force of some sort. So it's, it's over there, over here. Yeah, let's right go this take way. a look. I was very curious to see what we could see and look at the details of the formation. Skeptics were quick to call the whole affair a hoax attributing the work to clever pranksters like those shown in this TV documentary. Well, I'm from a farming background, so I know what it looks like when plants are driven over or uh, flattened in some way. So it was very clear to us that it hadn't been flattened by somebody out there with planks and boards. You can't do that to thistle. It was very densely grown, and it would be very difficult for anybody to get in without leaving tracks behind. Paul Anderson, director of the CCCRN, has studied many similar formations in Western Canada. Well, anybody can go out with a board and flatten down wheat. You know, I could do that, anyone could do that. And yet something you have to take into account is it's not just the formation itself, but it's the complexity of how it's actually constructed, which even in some of the ones here in Saskatchewan we've seen, 
have been quite elaborate, like multiple layers going in different directions, one on top of the other, and so on. Paul believes another factor makes it improbable the so-called Edmonton Circle was a hoax. Unlike England's mysterious Stonehenge region, where many crop circles have been sighted, Western Canada holds little of that same mystique. What would be the point? You know, usually when you hoax something, you want to claim it after and make a big fuss about it and, you know, make a name for yourself. As Judy Art examined the site, she carefully documented each of the circles within the formation. Judy also gathered up crop and soil samples for scientific analysis. Each sample is numbered and there's a corresponding sample of the grain stalks and of the soil at that particular location. So those are all numbered and written on a chart. The samples were analyzed by Nancy Talbot in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Nancy works with a consortium of scientists who have studied more than 350 crop circle cases from eight different countries. The three major changes in plants in the real McCoy as opposed to man-made crop circles are node elongation, expulsion cavities at the nodes, and germination abnormalities. Each of these conditions was present in the crop samples sent from Edmonton. In other words, both internal and external characteristics of the crops were profoundly altered in ways that could not be induced by humans using ropes and boards. There is a, a sense that you're walking into something special. I have always equated it to walking into... Former high-ranking British government official Colin Andrew has witnessed this phenomenon many times. There's preciseness. The geometry is precise. There are no tracks in or out. The plants are not damaged. They're bent over. They're not knuckled or broken. The plants are changed at, in their internal structure at the cellular level. You don't find that in the hoax. Meanwhile, the soil samples from the Edmonton site were sent to Dr. Sampath Iyengar in California. Dr. Iyengar is an expert in material analysis. We went ahead and looked at the mineralogy of the clays using a technique called X-ray powder diffraction. That's the technique that can be used to identify the type of clays and the type of various other minerals that are present in a soil. The results showed a dramatic difference between the soil samples taken from inside the crop circle compared to those taken from outside the circle. This has been seen by geologists before, but this is in a geologic time over several millions of years, plus at a lot higher temperature than what you would expect in a crop circle. And this has to be some kind of a fantastic energy or some kind of laser type of thing that's causing this change. And I don't have any idea what it is. Do the crop circles in Western Canada finally provide conclusive evidence of unknown forces at work? Skeptics say no. They blame pranksters who proudly take credit for making 80% of these often complex formations, creations they call human land art. But what about the other 20%? It's a debate that's been raging since the mid-1970s, when a wave of crop circles captured worldwide attention. The most compelling question remains unanswered. If they are not the work of humans, then who or what created them and how? Theories range from geothermal and magnetic forces to some kind of cosmic energy. We looked at meteorology, we looked at earth energies, we looked at chemical application of the farmers, and all of them led to a blank. It just did not fit. What we now know is we have a solid mystery. This cannot be explained uh, in the terms of people making them. We have many hundreds that are absolutely, certainly not man-made. And, and that is a, a, a solid fact. Things like compasses will deviate or even spin if you sit them on the ground, you know, like in the center of a circle. Things like that, which to me, hoaxing simply doesn't explain because something has to be affecting that compass. Even compasses and airplanes have been affected flying over some of these. You know, I had problems with my own camera, 
both on the ground and in the plane. Any kind of electrical equipment will often just malfunction or go completely dead inside some of these. Perhaps most intriguing of all the proposed theories is the one that claims at least some crop circles are the work of extraterrestrials. I was contacted by a young couple who had been driving uh, along in the late evening. So do you have to work next weekend? Uh, maybe. I think they're going to call me anyway. She was taking her husband to work in North Edmonton. I thought you were going to have a weekend off. He looked out the window and saw some lights and rolled down the window to make sure it wasn't just reflection on his passenger side window. What is that? And the lights were still there. He got quite excited about it and asked his wife to pull over. There were two small lights, brilliant bluish. Is that a plane? No, plants don't move like that. And they said these two lights looked like they were playing tag with each other. No one's ever going to believe this. And it went on for, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds. This sighting occurred about a week before the uh, crop circle formation was found. Then a few days later, Rusty Manuel and Thelly Whitman had their own close encounter. We were just approaching our farm when we saw this light. What's that? What? Yeah. First you thought it was a helicopter because it moved like a helicopter, but still there was no other lights on it. That is so weird. I don't know what that is. It was just bright and would just hover over the field and sort of move off and then come back again. Oh my God, I've never seen anything like that. I tried to picture it as being an aircraft, but it, it was too much too big for an aircraft. That's no airplane. No. And it just seemed like it passed over the back end of the pickup, and it just, it just disappeared. It just was so fast. Was there a connection between the strange lights in the sky and the sudden appearance of the Edmonton crop circles just days later? Seth Shostak is senior astronomer at the SETI Institute an acronym meaning the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Seth and his colleagues explore the heavens for any sign of life. I believe that the aliens are out there, but I don't think that they're visiting here. The fact that so many people feel that there may be something unusual going on here, crop circles, UFOs, and so forth, I think this speaks a psychological need that we all have to, to believe that there are some powers that we don't understand. And after all, it's much more interesting to think that this pattern in the weed here was graffiti from beings from another world than to think that it was students from the local university. That's not a terribly interesting story. But what about crop circles that simply defy logic, formations that show no sign of human intervention? That certainly seemed to be the case in Red Deer, Alberta, not far from Edmonton. According to a stunned local farmer, this giant Star of David formation literally appeared overnight in one of his fields. It measured an incredible 422 feet across. Still skeptics like Seth Shostak believe it's all smoke and mirrors. When I go to a stage show in Las Vegas and I see these grand illusions produced by these magicians, I don't understand how they're all done. In fact, I don't understand how most of them are done. And I could assume some unknown physical force is involved. This would be terribly important if it were true about the crop circles, but the facts are that to say that they are made by something other than humans is a radical, a revolutionary claim. And consequently, I'm not going to be swayed by what amounts to very anecdotal evidence. It's got to be better than that. I don't think we need necessarily to be talking or trying to prove that it is or isn't extraterrestrial. I don't know that either. What I know is what I'm looking at that has arrived in our fields. Something knows what it's doing here. There is intelligence of some sort. And I know they're not all made by people. Over the past three decades, researchers have compiled a database that includes more than 10,000 crop circle reports from around the world. If 8,000 of these strange formations can be attributed to pranksters, there still leaves more than 2,000 that are simply unexplained. Yeah, um, 
Um, I'd like to put an ad in the personals for a week. Single, white female, 47. August 1998. A woman calling herself Diana Ray decided to place an ad in the personal section of a Louisiana newspaper. I'm honest and hardworking and seeking a compatible single white male, 45 through 55, to enjoy life together. Diana Ray was hardly being honest. According to authorities, Diana was a drifter who hitchhiked around the country looking for her next mark a lonely man to latch onto and drain his bank account. In fact, her real name was not Diana at all. It was Hazel Leota Head. A man named Charles Barker would have been interested in any one of these details if he had only known. Charles Barker had recently suffered through the devastating sudden loss of his wife of 10 years. She was killed by a drunk driver. It was a settlement out of court and uh, he came into a lot of money. But after she died, it just seemed like he kind of fell apart. Um, he didn't know what to do with himself, I think. He was depressed. But then later on, he, it's like he snapped out of it and wanted to do things, go fishing and travel. He bought a Winnebago, a boat. I guess that's when the loneliness set in, you know, he didn't like doing them by himself. The Riverboat Casinos operating on the Red River in Bossier City, Louisiana, became Charles Barker's latest diversion. <laughs> all right, all right. Although he probably believed he and Diana became acquainted by chance, given her track record, she undoubtedly orchestrated the meeting. Is this seat taken? Well, it is now, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I just took it. Well, you did. Charles Barker carried pretty large amounts of cash with him. Hazel would have almost certainly noticed that because she'd be looking for those kinds of things. You look like you're doing pretty good over there. And so he would have become a target for her. You know what? I might ask you to help me because I'm not doing too good here. Well, your hand looks pretty good right now. Let's see. They shared a whirlwind romance. And less than a year after the death of his wife and within days of their initial meeting, Hazel had moved in with Charles Barker. Dad told me he'd met a woman in a casino. You know, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I just, I hope he's happy and I don't want to see him alone. You know, I thought maybe she uh, would be a good companion for him. And evidently he was happy with her for a while because he would call me and say he liked her. You gonna carry me over the threshold? Well, I'm gonna give it one good old try, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> he needed someone, some companionship. He didn't like to be alone. So you're looking really good, Dad. Tell me about this one. One weekend, Jennifer made the nine-hour drive from her Austin, Texas home to meet her father's new girlfriend. Hey, sugar, I'm all out of ammo. Oh, hon, Deanna, I want you to meet my, my daughter, Jennifer. Oh, hi. Jennifer, Deanna. Nice to meet you. Boy, oh, look at this. When I first met her, she was in the casino with my dad. So are you from around here? I'm from all She wasn't very, you know, a real presentable woman. You know, um, just no go. class. Nice to meet you. She looked like a, a bar fly, you know. I was suspicious of her. Um, I knew she, she wasn't right for him. Daddy, what's going on? You do not sound... A short time later, even Charles apparently began to share that opinion. One big old messy situation here. According to his daughter, Cindy, Charles admitted he was troubled in a phone conversation, but declined to reveal what his problems were. Daddy, I, I can help you with this, please. Sweetheart, listen to me. Trust me here. Next week we'll get together, and I promise you, and I'll sit down with you, and I'll tell you everything. When my dad right called now, me, he just sounded so different, and um, he started crying, and I've never, you know, heard my uh, dad cry or anything. And um, But he told me he'd call me in two or three days, everything would be okay, and let me know what was going on. But that explanation never came. Shortly afterward, Jennifer tried calling her father to arrange another visit. I'd been trying to phone him for the whole week. And uh, no answer. And I finally called my aunt. And she said, we'll go by there and check on him. Charles Barker's sister, June, and her husband drove over to see if there was a problem. Charlie. 
Charlie? June Stringer and her husband notice that the front door of the residence is open. So they proceed further. The husband looks in and sees Mr. Barker slumped over the bar. Charles Barker had been dead for five days, killed by a single gunshot to the head. As investigators combed the crime scene, several observations were made. Our detectives found no sign of a struggle. They did not find a house that had been ransacked. Mr. Barker had a uh, 25 caliber Raven Arms pistol that he kept in his residence. There were no prints found on the gun, but the ballistics evidence uh, indicates that that was the weapon that was used. Mr. Barker had a safe that he kept in his bedroom. Uh, the safe was opened when investigators arrived. Except for Charles Barker's personal papers, it was empty. I know for a fact that my dad always kept money in there. And at that time, I believe he probably had $45,000 at least in that safe. Also missing was Charles Barker's Lincoln Town Car and his girlfriend. Mr. Barker's vehicle was found the next day after his body was discovered. It was found uh, near the airport. Inside the car were pieces of clothing uh, that belonged to Hazel. Also found in the car was DNA evidence, physical evidence that we believe definitely links her to the car. We believe she is the one that took the car from his residence and drove it to that spot near the airport. A background check on Hazel had revealed that she'd been married as many as 10 times and was known to use more than a dozen aliases. There was also an outstanding warrant for her arrest in Lincoln, Nebraska. Hazel Head had allegedly burned down her boyfriend's mobile home, then fled before standing trial. Did Hazel Head murder Charles Barker and escape with an unknown amount of cash? Had this been her plan from the very beginning? Our investigators theorized that Mr. Barker was probably at the bar reading the newspaper. Hazel came out of the bedroom with the gun, the 25 caliber. He didn't realize that she was behind him. We believe that Mr. Barker probably never knew what hit him. But was Hazel Head plotting yet another scam, even while she was still living with Charles Barker? Louisiana authorities subsequently recovered a recording of a personals ad she placed shortly before his murder. This is Hazel Head in her own voice. Lonely men everywhere, beware. And I'm looking for a single white male between 45 and 55 to have a good time, enjoy life, and just be all around happy. Hazel Head is known to frequent truck stops, often hitching rides from town to town. Well, I heard you say you was going to Dallas. Investigators believe she easily blends into that environment and never stays long in one place. Hazel Head is a very street smart woman. She flies below radar. To track Hazel Head is uh, very difficult. She becomes almost like a ghost. It's like uh, she's here and she's gone. But it must not be forgotten that she is a dangerous person, that she might have killed even before Mr. Barker was murdered. She may have killed since. Uh, she has a dark side to her. Hazel Head stands five feet, two inches tall. She has a scar near her right eye and a gap between her front teeth. Head is wanted for the first degree murder of Charles Barker and should be considered dangerous. Oregon City, Oregon is a small blue collar town of 27,000 people just south of Portland. A friendly place where adults trust their neighbors and children play without fear. But suddenly everything changed. Over a six-week period, two young girls vanished without a trace. 
setting in motion one of the most complex and unusual investigations state authorities have ever encountered. Nestled among the hills of Oregon City sits Newell Creek Village Apartments. The complex includes 125 units and is home to more than 325 residents, including Lori Pond and her 12-year-old daughter, Ashley. Hey, Ashley, you better hurry up. You're going to be late. I'm coming, Mom. January 9th, 2002. Ashley was running late as usual. It was a little after 8 a.m., and she had only a few minutes to catch the bus. Love you, bye. The walk up the hill to the bus stop took less than 10 minutes. Ashley was a popular student and member of both the swimming and dance teams. On that Wednesday, she was looking forward to practice after class. Lori Pond expected to hear from her daughter by 6.15 p.m. When she didn't, Lori became worried and called the school. Hi. The dance coach answered. She said, no, Ashley wasn't there. And I said, well, can you ask the kids? Maybe they saw her. And they said no. And they said they hadn't even seen her in school. And that's where I went, well, this is, this is wrong. Something's wrong because Ashley would not have done that and she would have called me. Now, when was Ashley last seen? Lori immediately contacted the Oregon City Police. She told the officer none of Ashley's clothes or personal belongings was missing. Things she was sure her daughter would have taken had she run away. She no, school. no, no, no. I didn't sleep that no. night at all. I just thought maybe she would, you know, come home and I'd, you know, knock on the door or whatever, but she never did. The police concluded there might be a child abductor on the loose and opened an investigation. Detectives first talked with some of Ashley's classmates. They said she never got on the bus. Next, police canvassed the entire apartment complex, looking for leads or possible suspects. They found neither. The investigators have been able to search every apartment within that complex, including crawl spaces and attic spaces, and uh, are confident that there was nothing there to see. The search expanded. Hundreds of volunteers combed the surrounding area, while detectives questioned Ashley's father, looked into Ashley's internet activity and checked out lists of known sex offenders. Again, no clues, no suspects, and no sign of Ashley. Detectives then contacted the FBI. We've moved to the larger community around the apartment complex. We've been through the school. We've talked to individual students who are associates. We've talked to teachers. We've talked to administrators. Uh, we've talked to the school as a whole. More dead ends, and still the same fundamental question remained unanswered. What had happened to Ashley Pond between 8.05 a.m. and 8.15 a.m.? It's really hard to believe that happened to one of your friends or something. Meanwhile, 13-year-old Miranda Gaddis, Ashley's neighbor and dance teammate, found herself in the middle of an intense investigation. How do you do, Miranda? Hi. Could you tell me how long you've actually known Ashley? Since about third grade. The third FBI have talked to Miranda a lot about yeah, Ashley because they've known each other for so long. Dance classes. They were yeah. friends, and I'm sure that they knew pretty much the same people. Days turned to weeks. Still no sign of Ashley Pond. And life at the apartment complex became somewhat normal again. Hey, honey. Good morning, Mom. March 8th, 2002. Yeah. Michelle Duffy packed up for work as usual. It was 7.30 a.m. Her daughter Miranda was in no hurry. She still had 45 minutes before the school bus arrived. Police believe Miranda left her apartment a little after 8 a.m. and headed up the hill for the bus stop. Hi, this is Michelle. About 1.20, my oldest daughter called me. She didn't. And said Miranda's friend said she wasn't at school. So of course I called home, no one answered, and then I called the school, and the school said, oh yeah, she's absent. And then I got very upset. Oh my God, something's wrong. Thank you, no, no, thank you. And I went to the police station, and they took a report and started right then on the case. Everybody's reaction was the same of, uh, you know, oh my God, not again. 
Minutes later, police raced to the apartment complex, hoping against hope Miranda Gaddis would show up. She didn't. We notified the FBI and immediately ratcheted up just a full-scale uh, investigation and search. Well, when I heard Miranda had came up missing also, my heart dropped into my stomach and I cried because and it, it, it was like reliving the day Ashley came up missing all over again. The circumstances surrounding Miranda's disappearance on March 8, 2002 were eerily similar to those of Ashley Pond two months earlier. Even more ominous was a striking resemblance between the two girls. They're about the same height and weight, and both have brown eyes. We've got a mirror image of a victim and an occurrence. It is almost as if uh, uh, the same child disappeared twice, uh, and it was just a repeat. Like Ashley, Miranda usually took the road up the hill to catch the bus. Had she been snatched by a stranger on the way? Had Ashley met a similar fate? It's feasible that if we're dealing with a stranger abduction, that Ashley's disappearance was a, it was a crime of opportunity at, at that one moment in time, and that the offender, having been successful, came back uh, to the same area to do it again. A crime of opportunity committed by a stranger it was certainly plausible, but the mothers of the two girls found it highly unlikely. They both would have put up a, a stink if somebody tried to take them, a, they didn't know. If someone grabbed Miranda, she would have fought and there would have been something laying in the road. Without an apparent crime scene, police began to focus on another, perhaps more likely theory. There's nothing to indicate there was any struggle or any resistance. There's no blood, no articles of clothing, or anything of that nature. So, so we also have the possibility we're dealing with somebody that, uh, that both of them knew. Since the disappearance of Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis, the school bus now picks up students right outside their doors. However, residents of Newell Creek Village Apartments, indeed all of Oregon City, remain on edge, terrified that a child abductor walks among them. This is the type of offender that doesn't stop on their own volition. This type of uh, multiple uh, uh, sexual predator is someone that, at least in the uh, general experience, uh, dictates that they will continue until they're stopped. Investigators have processed over 3,500 tips. Still, they have no suspects. However, the search continues for any lead that might help crack these puzzling cases. Meanwhile, two hardworking single mothers suffer through every parent's nightmare and try their best to remain hopeful. Miranda, I love you, and your family loves you, your friends love you, and everyone misses you, and we want you home, and whoever has you, we're never gonna give up. We're gonna be here forever. I can't wait for the day that I can wrap my arms around Ashley again and tell her I love her. Update. On August 27, 2002, the desperate search for Ashley Pond and Miranda Gaddis ended tragically at a neighbor's house just a few hundred yards from where the girls were last seen. The remains of Miranda Gaddis were found in a shed in the backyard of Ward Weaver's rented home. Two days later, in the same backyard, investigators broke up a concrete slab to unearth the body of Ashley Pond. When the gruesome discovery was made, the 39-year-old Weaver was in custody, charged with raping his son's girlfriend. He is being held on a $1 million bond. Weaver is expected to be charged in the deaths of the two girls. of Milwaukee is home to hundreds of law-abiding blue-collar families. Not long ago, this peaceful neighborhood was invaded by a vicious gang of drug dealers known as the Lopez family. Allegedly, the gang's principal enforcer is 20-year-old Arthur Lopez, Jr. 
Police believe Arthur is behind a bloody wave of terror that has left three people dead and countless lives destroyed. Hopefully someone watching can help authorities find Arthur Lopez Jr. The Lopez family reportedly bought seven houses in a two block radius to oversee their drug empire. What's up, homie? When a rival gang called the Latin Kings tried to move into their area, authorities believe the Lopez's did not hesitate to act. Vamos. Anyone who gets in their way reportedly has to face this man, Arthur Jr., the alleged hitman for the Lopez family. Carlos Hernandez was once a member of the Latin Kings, but according to his family, Carlos had recently left the gang and turned his life around. He just seen drive-bys and he started to see how very rarely do they hit their intended target. They, they'll hit innocent bystanders, kids playing on their bikes in front of their houses. He knew it was a possibility that could happen to anybody. And he, he felt best that he'd, he'd get out the gang and, uh, and turn it around and, and really try to help the neighborhood come back to what it was once was before. Carlos Hernandez organized a youth basketball league and took a job with a city organization that helps kids stay out of gangs. A major part of his job was to try and mediate problems between the gangs in that particular area. So what do you think, Bob? These fools are taking all our business. The Lopez family had come to Mr. Hernandez uh, with a problem with the Latin Kings over territory. Police believe that Hernandez failed to resolve the Lopez's turf dispute with the Latin Kings. Arthur Lopez Jr. was allegedly given the order to take care of Hernandez. According to witnesses, Arthur Lopez Jr. and several family members surrounded the building where Carlos Hernandez worked. There was a uh, predetermined code that they were going to broadcast on the radio when Mr. Hernandez was spotted. Uh, the code was, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and that code was put out when Mr. Hernandez left from his business to his vehicle. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. At 4.30 p.m., authorities believe Arthur Lopez Jr. donned a mask, hopped on a bike, and coasted toward the unsuspecting Hernandez. Carlos Hernandez was hit by eight bullets and died instantly. It was a nightmare. We, we missed some. Um, and we wish it had never happened. Um, the hardest part is uh, uh, at family gathering, seeing my sister and my mother cry. Because he's not terrible. Although Arthur Lopez Jr. was a suspect in Hernandez's homicide, police had little evidence against him or his family. Then Arthur made a seemingly harmless mistake. Arthur Lopez was arrested for driving without a license. While he was being processed, police received an unexpected visitor. Why you arrest my son? Arthur's father, Arturo Sr., second in command of the Lopez family. Calm down, Mr. Lopez. Why are you sweating my kid? Because of me? Because of who I am? Arturo Lopez Sr. demanded the release of his son uh, and threatened to return with a firearm and to kill all the police officers who were involved uh, in Arthur Lopez Jr.'s arrest. How did you get my strap and smoke all of you? under arrest. I'll kill you first. Arthur Lopez Jr. could not be held on the misdemeanor traffic charge and was released. But Arturo Sr. was convicted of threatening a police officer and sentenced to 18 months in jail. His incarceration gave the authorities the opportunity they'd been looking for. While Arturo Lopez Sr. was in prison, 
Uh, he made uh, daily phone calls to his son and other members of the Lopez family, uh, basically directing the continued uh, narcotics distribution uh, activities uh, of the Lopez gang. He's going to give you a paquete. I want you to drop it off at Chino's pad. All of these uh, phone calls that were made by Arturo Lopez uh, Sr. were Second. recorded by the uh, prison phone system. Uh, so there are recorded copies of all the conversations from both ends of the telephone. As authorities continued to build their case against the Lopez's, there was yet another violent outburst. Once again, according to witnesses, Arthur Lopez Jr. played a principal role. That's that punk act right there. It's clear, man, it's clear. Come on. On August 11th, Maximiano Castillo, a known member of the Latin Kings and his girlfriend, Vanessa Rivas, returned home after a quick trip to the grocery store. A car was shadowing the couple. All right, I'm going. Police believed that the driver was Arthur Lopez Jr. and that his passenger was another Lopez gang member named Luis Acevedo. You Max! Que pasó, Holmes? Que pasó, bro? I got a message from a friend, bro. Yeah, so what's up? You a dead man, punk! Vanessa Rivas, a completely innocent bystander who had just celebrated her 15th birthday, was unable to escape the rain of bullets. We know that uh, Vanessa Rivas was hit once in the side. Um, the, the bullet did a lot of damage and she basically bled to death. Mr. Castillo was struck a number of times, at least three times, uh, by the bullets fired by Mr. Acevedo, and he also died from his injuries. In the ensuing months, authorities used Arturo Sr.'s tape phone calls and eyewitness testimony to secure arrest warrants against Arthur Lopez Jr. and the rest of his family. On December 15th, a multi-jurisdictional task force moved to put the Lopez gang out of business for good. Large stashes of guns, drugs, and money were seized. Eight individuals were arrested, destroying the gang's ability to terrorize a community. Only one Lopez family member managed to escape the citywide dragnet, Arthur Lopez Jr. He has now avoided arrest for nearly two years. He's got to pay. He's done so much hurt to many people, families, and uh, and he's a coward. He's he's hiding. We need we need we need to get him. Get him off the streets. Every mystery there is someone, somewhere, who holds the key. Join me for the next edition of Unsolved Mysteries.